The Prime Minister has launched the election campaign he said he never wanted. If the first 24 hours of Tory gaffes has anything to go by, he might already be wishing he hadn't. I've uh, just been to see Her Majesty the Queen earlier on. Boris Johnson formally gets the general election underway today. But campaigning for December the 12th is already in full swing. The SNP is making its familiar pitch, allow Scotland to decide its own future. But the Greens pledge £100 billion a year on climate action. But as always, the NHS is proving to be one of the most crucial battlegrounds. We'll be able to spend hundreds of millions every week on our priorities, such as the NHS. Boris Johnson is trying to hijack Brexit to sell out our National Health Service. The Lib Dems set out what they see as the benefits of not leaving the EU at all. That Remain bonus will be £50 billion that we can spend on our public services. The Brexit party says it will stand in more than 600 seats, claiming their sights are set on Labour leave areas. I don't think the Conservatives are going to win these seats that have been Labour for decade after decade. I think it's a fantasy. Corbyn would be so bad for your country. With a call from the White House, Donald Trump entered the UK election campaign. Jacob Rees-Mogg caused widespread offence with his comments about Grenfell Tower. If either of us were in a fire, whatever the fire brigade said, we would leave a burning building. It just seems the common sense thing to do. And then this, a cabinet resignation. Within the last few minutes, Alan Cairns resigning, but doing so after mounting pressure on him. Tonight, I'll be asking the Tories how they can get their campaign back on track. And can Labour really get Brexit sorted by the middle of next year? Good evening, live from Westminster on the first official day of the 200, 2019 election campaign. And the air is already thick with fake news. Uh, the Tories doctored a video to show Labour's Keir Starmer unable to answer a Brexit question on Good Morning Britain, whereas, in fact, he had answered it. The Tory party chairman said the dodgy edit was merely light-hearted and satirical. Who knew the Tories were auditioning for the London Palladium and not bidding to run the country? Labour, for its part, is claiming that a trade deal with the US would cost the NHS £500 million a week. Mr Corbyn said it was, quote, a credible and accurate figure. But BBC Reality Check has found it to be neither. And then there's the dear old Lib Dems, past masters of the dodgy histogram. Sophie Ridge confronted the Lib Dem leader with one on Sky News. Like others doing the rounds, it showed the Lib Dems breathing down the Tories' necks in a particular constituency. Until you read the small print and discover it's either not true or a complete distortion. Our advice for this campaign? Always read the small print. Now, the Conservative Party is about to launch its election campaign in about half an hour in the West Midlands. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, is there. Laura, it's not been a great 24 hours for the Conservatives. I assume that they'll be attempting to put the show back on the road with this event tonight. Yeah, no question about it. It's been a very tricky start for the Tories, having to deal with the outrage, pretty widespread, at remarks from Jacob Rees-Mogg about the tragedy at Grenfell Tower yesterday. And then overnight, after a BBC report, the Welsh Secretary, Alan Cairns, became the first Cabinet Minister we can find in political history to quit during election, an election campaign. So look, clearly it is not a good backdrop for Boris Johnson at the beginning, but he will be here tonight, I think, with all the bells and whistles and razzmatazz, that kind of stage that as a happy campaigner, he loves and adores, and you can almost see him take energy from the crowd. He'll be speaking to mass ranks of supporters here in the West Midlands, of course, plenty of key marginals here. And I think for Tory HQ, this is the first big day to turn the page and actually get on with it. And are, are there going to be any surprises? Are we expecting some announcements tonight, some things we don't know, or is it just going to be more of the same? I think it will be more of the same. And in a funny way, Andrew, I think the Conservatives are not looking to throw surprises into the mix in the course of this campaign. 
clearly along the way there'll be the odd policy put forward here and there that maybe we weren't quite sure whether or not it was going to end up in the manifesto. But as far as Tory HQ is concerned, there is one route to victory here, which is to make the case to the public that they are the ones who can end the agony of the last three years and then get on to talking about the things that people care about much more in the round, whether that's schools or hospitals or all the sort of political greatest hits that parties love to talk about so much. And in that sense, for as long as, as one cabinet minister described it to me, we can stick with that. They believe that is a path to victory which would get them seeing us out of the European Union in January. Of course, there's two big risks for them in that. Not one, just that events will knock them off, of course, as they already have done in the last 24 hours. But of course, also, they are surrounded by opponents from the rest of the political spectrum, trying everything they can to make life as difficult as they possibly can. And you know, one thing that's really striking this time compared to the last general election, of course, it's really early days, but if you talk to senior people in government, they are really, really unsure about where this is going to end. They can see a path to a win to getting Boris Johnson into number 10 with a majority, but they're well aware that that path is steep, narrow and full of rocks. Thanks for that, uh, Laura. Laura, they're in the West Midlands because that's where the Conservatives aim to pick up a number of Labour seats. They're hoping for Labour voters, leavers to move to the Conservative Party. So let's stay with the Tories for the moment. I spoke to the Business Minister, Nadim Sahawi, earlier this evening. Uh, Nadim Sahawi, the Secretary of State for Wales, was forced to resign today because he'd endorsed a Tory candidate for the Welsh Assembly that he knew had been part of the collapse of a rape trial. If he's not fit to serve in the Cabinet, why is he fit to represent the Vale of Glamorgan? In his letter, he does say that he's confident he can clear his name. Um, this is obviously a very sensitive issue and there's still he legal proceedings. He won't clear it in time for the election. Uh, but, look, a man is innocent. Is the, you know, this, is, this country prides itself on its legal system and, of course, uh, he has, I think, the right uh, to be allowed the space to clear his name, Andrew. Um, and I think that the people of the Vale of Glamorgan will um, back Alan, will return because he's been a very fine constituency MP. Another cabinet minister, Jacob Rees-Mogg, mm. he opined that if more Grenfell Tower residents had ignored the fire brigade and left the building, more would have survived. What possible qualifications does he have to make that judgment? Well, he has apologised unreservedly uh, when he misspoke. Um, and I think... He misspoke? It, he did, absolutely. I, uh, Andrew, have you uh, never misspoken in your life? Have you ever met a human being that's never misspoken? I, 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 I tell you this, Mr Zahawi, it would never cross my advice to give... Ad, 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 my mind to give advice to people in a tar block mm. that's on fire. I don't disagree with you. He Mr. did. But, and he's apologised unreservedly for it. And I think, as I say, you know, we're all human. We make mistakes. He's made a mistake. And he has said that he unequivocally apologises. Right. But, but what does this tell you about his mindset or the Tory mindset? He's never lived in a tower block. We don't even know if he's ever been in a tower block. Uh, he's certainly never been trapped in a fire in one. I mean, this, isn't this the new height of Tory arrogance to lecture the people of Grenville? on what the common sense thing would have been to do on that terrible tragedy? Well, first of all, no-one has the right to lecture the people of Grenfell. No apology is good enough for the people of Grenfell, which Including is why his. We, we held an inquiry. Um, we have the, phase, the first yeah. phase of that inquiry, and we're absolutely going to deliver on the recommendations. There'll be the second phase right. of that inquiry. But, look... To but your he point, pays no price right, for, the, but, for these words. Well, hold on. No. He has paid a price because he has had to come out and apologise, rightly so. But, look, let's just step back a second, Andrew. Right? If this is about demonising the Conservative Party, because that's what Labour is good at, to say that we're nasty Tories, do you know, to dehumanise, to demonise people is a process that then allows you to attack them in all sorts of ways. I... Um, so it's the poor, conservative... It's, it's the poor, poor Tory party no, that are victims now. No, no. You're being demonised. No. No, you have every right to criticise and to um, challenge our policies, to challenge when we make a mistake, but to say that the whole party 
is somehow a, you know, a, a nasty organisation. It's simply not true. All right, well, listen to the what... Standing for listen to what one of your so, colleagues had to say about Jacob uh, Rees-Mogg. I think I can, uh, I can uh, probably Andrew guess... Bridge, I Bridges, guess he's gonna now get. a candidate. He was, until this week, an MP. He's running again. This is what he said defending Jacob Rees-Mogg. But we want very clever people running the country, don't we, Evan? That's a byproduct of, of what Jacob is, and that's why he's in a, in, a, in a position of authority. What he's actually saying is he would have made a better decision than the authority figures who gave that advice. It's just ridiculous, isn't it's, it? I regret it. Um, I think Andrew has apologised. Again, uh, does every Tory who mentions the word Grenfell then have to apologise? No, but if they misspeak, if they, if they say something that is clearly wrong, um, they should apologise, and but, Andrew Bridgen has apologised. But let's just stand back a bit and see. It's not about demonising the whole of the Conservative Party, but there is a pattern here. We have a multi-millionaire old Etonian saying he's got more common sense than the ordinary folk of Grenfell. We've got another Tory cabinet minister backing a former aide who was involved in a collapsed rape trial. The judge said it was done intentionally. And I haven't even mentioned your candidate in Gower, who said that certain folks on benefit should be, quote, put down. What does all that say about the character of your party? Well, I can tell you what it says, is when we have uh, the first Muslim Chancellor of the Exchequer in Sajid Javid, uh, a boy from Rochdale living above a shop, we make him Chancellor of the Exchequer. When you have someone who's a, 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 of Kurdish background like me came to this country fleeing Saddam Hussein, that is the party. So why are you alongside I... people who say these things? Well, as I said, look, people make Do mistakes. Do they belong in your party? That people on benefits should be, quote, put down. She apologised. You always apologise. Said... It seems to me that all we have to do in the Tory party is apologise and you carry on as normal. Well, first No of penalty all, is paid. That, that's not true. That is absolutely not true because we've had uh, parliamentarians who have been suspended or for you know, whatever the, 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 the misdemeanor. We are all human, Andrew. I understand that. We should be allowed the chance to make good. But That's sometimes when the rest of us make a mistake, we pay a penalty. But I, let me go to the, the political price you could pay for this mm. because we hear a lot at the moment about blue-collar conservatism uh, about the, in the Boris Johnson Tory party. You hope to win Labour Leave voters in the Midlands and the North. But these comments that I've quoted, don't they just show that the Tory elite, you've got nothing in common with working class voters. You've no empathy, you've no insight, you've no experience, you've just got disdain and smug superiority. That is absolutely not true, and I do not recognise that as my party. And I would not belong well, to Jacob a party Jacob like would have no. more common sense than the folk of Grenfell. He, he said... The, the Gower candidate says people on benefits, some of them should be put down. If that's not disdain, what is? Jacob apologised. The uh, candidate for Gower apologised. People can make mistakes. They should be allowed a second so chance. nothing has gone right for you in the past 48 hours in this campaign. Is that why the Prime Minister decided to kick it off this morning by comparing Jeremy Corbyn to Stalin's persecution of the Kulaks? Well, I think Boris has got a point. I think if really? Jeremy, absolutely, if Jeremy Corbyn gets his way, this country will become Britain's Wela. Britain will be but like he wasn't Venezuela. Talking about Venezuela. He was talking about Stalin. I, well, I'm, and going, the Kulaks. I'm, I'm giving you another image of no, what it I'm would be like. You, is it a fair comparison? Is it in yeah. any way a sensible comparison to compare Jeremy Corbyn's attitude to? Uh, business people and to rich people mm. to Stalin's persecution of the Kulak farmers. Well, Judge Jeremy Corbyn, by his words, he says that he wants to increase taxes on business because he is obsessive about tax rate, mm. not tax take. You know this better than any, anyone. He wants to mm. you know, really hammer businesses um, and doesn't like the idea that right. corporation tax is down at 19%, coming down further right. to 18 and 17%. Right. By the way, the take into the Treasury has gone up. Why? Because businesses invest when they see that actually the government's right. on their side. Jeremy Corbyn is not on the side of business. Right. And he That's... wants to create a them-and-us society. That he's, he's all about division. He wants to demonise the wealth creators, the entrepreneurs that yes. make this country great, that pay and for that, all the public services. And that's your line, and that's fine. No, it's fine. not. That's the truth. Well, that's what you claim. 
And uh, we know that Mr Corbyn wants to raise taxes on the better off and raise taxes on business. And you can agree or disagree with that. But your leader compared him to Stalin and his persecution of the affluent Russian farmers. Can I just point out, this is not about raising taxes. This isn't even uh, uh, about uh, uh, forcing people to take big cuts in income. Stalin deported two million kulaks to Siberia. He had hundreds of thousands of them shot. He did nothing when five million peasants then starved to death. The comparison between that and Mr Corbyn wanting to raise taxes on the rich is absurd. Well, when you begin... Isn't it? No, when you begin to demonise the wealth creators, the entrepreneurs, it is, in my view, an incredibly dangerous road to go down. Because so when you have start, them shot? I don't know. You have to ask him that question. But oh, you can't, you're actually seriously saying to our viewers tonight that you don't know if Mr Corbyn's going to have wealthy people shot? We'll take their money away. He wants to to abolish yeah. all all public schools. Uh, hasn't explained to us how he's going to educate those six hundred thousand children not, that, look, that in, in the right state or sector. Wrong. And he wants not to shooting he, hundreds of. This is getting absurd. He wants to take away their property. You know, this country is a property owning wow. democracy. It cares about the legal rights of people. Jeremy Corbyn is attacking business, attacking property rights. He's not shooting people or starving them to death, is he? Well, you're right, but the analogy of attacking and dehumanising still holds. All right. Let's come to the dodgy stats. Health spending. The Prime Minister today claimed that the NHS was in line for another £34 billion. Mm. That's not true either, is it? No, it is, but, but £34 no, billion additional spending no, uh, by 2024. That's the cash figure. After inflation, which all public spending is judged by, mm. the inflation real figure... Is, inflation is incredibly low. I it? understand that, but right. you, imply low, you apply mm. low inflation mm. and the real figure is 20 billion over five years. Not 34 billion, 20 billion over five years. Now, I agree. I it's said a to you the 2024 chunk. number. But it's a greasing chunk, but it's not 34 billion. It is 34 billion in cash in 2024. But nobody judges things by cash. Why not? Because, because that's if, what people understand. Because Your if viewers does, understand cash. If it doesn't match inflation, it's not an increase. It's but, not a real increase. And by the way, even the 20 billion is less than the average annual increase the NHS has been given since it was founded. Less. Why can't you just be straight with voters? We are being straight. We're putting no, our, you're not. our numbers. You're scrutinising right now. We're doing exactly that on your show, and we're going to do more of it when we fully cost our manifesto, and people can then make a decision on those competing visions. Do they want okay. that investment, whether it's 34 billion in cash or 20 billion after taking inflation, or do they want two referenda, one on another rerun of Brexit and another one to break the union? That I is mean, the competing it, it all comes down to a matter of trust and the figures that politicians mm. tell us. And you want Brexit out of the way to concentrate on these things. Mm. I understand that. You call them the people's priorities. Like housing, which is another one. In the 2015 election, you promised to deliver 200,000 new starter homes for first-time buyers. Mm. How many... Have you built since that promise? Well, I, I saw this headline earlier saying that actually not... I don't think many have been built or none at the moment, but actually we've been building um, almost 300,000 homes. That's what uh, we want to... That's the ambition, is to get to the... Us That's the ambition. You're not building 300,000 300, so homes answer, every year. The answer, according to the National Audit Office, mm. is zero. Not 200,000. I just said that to you. Not 100,000. On that particular category. Not 50,000. Zero. You spent £174 million buying up the land, but you didn't build a single starter home on it. But you know what happens as well, Andrew, is that, that there's a planning process. You didn't deliver your promise. No, there's a pipeline. There's a planning process that you have to go through, which sometimes, in my view, takes too long. And I know Robert Jenrick, the Secretary of State, is doing you know, serious work in addressing this issue. Right. Uh, but we are building more homes, more affordable homes. You just didn't um, build any of the new starter homes. This particular category. Promise. After four years in which you made that promise, not a single home into that promise. That's trust. But we're building homes for those who want to get onto the just, housing ladder. Just that, not, not that, the ones you promised. Well, look, we can nitpick on this, Andrew. The reality is this government's done more to build affordable homes, um, making sure that we build 
um, more and give more to housing associations to build homes uh, okay. for those people who need them. That is what this government is delivering. But you'll be able to judge us on our, uh, not just our delivery, but also on what we want to do in our manifesto, which we will fully cost. Nadim Sahawi, thank you. Thank you very much. That's the Tories. Let's talk now to Labour's Shadow Transport Secretary, Andrew, Andy McDonald. He joins us now from Middlesbrough. Andy McDonald, your leader, Jeremy Corbyn, says that £500 million a week could be taken out of the NHS and handed to big drunk drug companies under Boris Johnson's plans for a sellout trade deal with Donald Trump. What's the basis of that figure? Well, Andrew, you and I will have seen the dispatches uh, uh, documentary uh, and the figures that came out of that from academia uh, and the discussions that, that were then had with the pharma industry in the United States. And they certainly want to see uh, overseas countries uh, giving a return on their investment and they want uh, uh, so that the Americans are not paying uh, more for their drugs than other people are. So they want to reap their rewards from those uh, those medicines and that could adversely impact on people who well, were in need of uh, diabetes medication right well let, and let's look at in more detail at this because it seems to be based on a report by dr andrew hill he's an advisor to the world health organization jeremy corbyn has said that the figures are quote credible and accurate uh, but dr hill himself said it's quote a crude estimate and the actual money is difficult to predict who's right well, I'm sure, I'm sure it's it's difficult to predict uh, uh, precisely, he but it gives you crude. a very good it gives you a very good indication of the intentions of the United States in a free trade agreement. And uh, Boris Johnson is simply wanting to walk into the arms of Donald Trump and, and allow our NHS to uh, uh, sustain swinging but, fees but, but, uh, from the pharma industry in the United States. On. And oh, uh, if on, that Mr. goes up from 18 billion to 45 billion, that's a third of the NHS budget. The and that's just not is, sustainable for us. The figure's ridiculous. The English uh, NHS drugs bill at the moment is 18 billion pounds a year. Why would any British yes. government agree to a deal that would add another 26 well, billion? I mean, it's ludicrous. You do, you're right. You do wonder, uh, Andrew, what on earth is going on in the mind of Boris Johnson? Well, but he's not. He it's not going on in his country. mind. And no oh, government would agree would leave us to a £26 billion rise in our drugs bill. No government. And Andrew, no uh, uh, right-minded government would seek to embrace a no-deal crash out of the European Union, trashing the economy of the United Kingdom. The first duty should surely be uh, to preserve our economy, not make it worse. But look, his, his interest is in big money, letting people have a feeding frenzy on our NHS, and it's our people who will suffer as a result. Uh, that's entirely the wrong direction, and right. that's why there's such a stark but choice my interest this general is trying election to, coming up. My interest is to try and establish the veracity of this £500 million a week. The figure is based on the UK paying American prices for all the drugs the NHS uses, drugs produced here, drugs coming from Europe or from Asia, or from all, why would UK drugs and drugs from non-US sources go to American prices? Well, you heard it on that uh, documentary I watched. No, I didn't. You watched it. You heard this. Oh, sorry. No, I didn't. I didn't you, hear you did. why all British oh, drug prices would go well, to American watch the levels. the documentary. Watch the documentary. It didn't claim that all British drug prices would go to American levels. Look, they're in business. They want to derive the absolute mm. maximum from this. <clears throat> and we heard it from the pharma industry themselves that we would have to pay dearly for this. So if you're, you're saying to me that it isn't five hundred million pounds a week, then come up with a different figure. All but right. In any way of looking at this, okay. it's a sharp increase well, in our uh, bill. Well, and let of course, me give that you a different figure. something that we should be spending on frontline services, Let me give not you a different feeding figure, the then. profits of pharma companies. How, what percentage of the drugs we use are imported from the United States? I don't know, Andrew. You've got it written down it's in front of you. Well, so, I've, I've yeah, got it if, because I've done my homework. It's under 10%. It's under 10%. 
So even if the UK government was foolish enough to agree to a rise in US drug prices, the extra cost would be 50 million, not 500 million. Well, well, the evidence was presented in that documentary. What's wrong with it what I just said? A, a reliable source. You've got uh, figures in front of you that you haven't shared with me uh, before just this uh, program. You. So I couldn't. Well, of course you have. Uh, but, you know, this is the. Uh, I, I would want to look at those figures very, very carefully. Well, let uh, me just ask you without a, a any, simple with question. Any, without any shadow of. I'll let me answer very simply. The f American pharma in industry are in this for big bucks and they want to get into our National Health Service. And right. Donald Trump was over here saying the NHS is on the table. Well, I've got news for, for Boris uh, uh, Johnson and for Donald Trump. It isn't on the table. The NHS is not for sale. I mean, you put this 500 million figure on the side of a bus, which, as I say, assumes that all our drug prices would go to American levels. It's a ridiculous assumption. But it's probably a good idea because it's about as accurate as the 350 million on the Leave campaign bus, isn't it, during the referendum? Indeed, it's even less accurate. It's even more of a fantasy well, we heard... figure than Boris Johnson's 350 million. Well, we heard that analysis taking us from a bill of 18 billion to 45 billion. Now, when somebody says that uh, from an academic and reasonable source, I will take it seriously because I'll never take any chances with our NHS. He said it was and a crude estimate. Anybody in the Labour Party. Well, even by reference to a crude okay. estimate, it, do, it isn't saying that it's wholly inaccurate or it, it, it bears no uh, relation well, to reality. It's an estimate at this stage. Well, let me and you're right. I let, think we want to better particularise that so we knew exactly what they were trying to, to, to stretch out of the NHS, and we're not having it. Well, let me ask you this again to see if I can get an answer. Let's suppose, it's far-fetched, but let's suppose a British government agreed to a rise in drugs we import from America to please US big pharma. Why would drugs produced in Britain and drugs the NHS buys from Europe rise to the American levels? Why would we let that happen? Well, we, we, of course, Andrew, would want to be uh, uh, having to be able to manufacture our own drugs that are out of patent and get that price down, get the cost of the NHS yeah. down. That's but, got to be the objective. But why would the so other 90% rise? Benefit. Why would the 90% well, of drugs we use that don't come from America rise to American levels? Because unless you can explain that, the 500 million figure is nonsense. Well, you, you say it's nonsense. It came from a credible source. If we're dealing with the, uh, the European Union, then clearly we want to have a close and, and collaborative and cooperative arrangement with the European Union so that we can ensure a strong supply of drugs that we can afford. Right. And, and that is one of the big issues that we would face opposite right. some of the uh, proposals from Boris Johnson and his far-right crew. I'm going to ask you this one more time because these are important figures and people can be scared if they think their drug bills are going to go through the roof. Uh, and, and it's important so it to get be. this right. So why would the 90% of drugs that we do not get from America, why would they reach American prices? Why would that ever because, happen? Because... Because, Andrew, there's an insatiable desire uh, to cut our links with the European Union and to put our, all our eggs in the basket of the United States. And that means that deal so, will so, be to the advantage of so, the United States. So we'd only import the, drugs from uh, America. The UK. We'd only import no, drugs I'm from America. No, I'm not saying that. If, no, listen to what I say, Andrew, instead of jumping down my throat. I'm saying to you that this Prime Minister is absolutely determined to look to the Atlantic and develop trade with the United okay. States, and that will be his principal right. concern, and that will be to our detriment. All right, Andy McDonald, I'm going to have to stop you there. Sale. We've run out of time, but I hope we'll return to this as the campaign progresses. Thanks Get for joining going. it. I'll be back with Politics Live at 12.15 tomorrow and back here on BBC Two with The Andrew Neil Show. Same time, same place next week. Bye-bye.